Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding is provided by a generous gift from Irene Hansen who shares your passion for gardening. Additional funding by Mark and Margaret Yakel Jolene in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. Gardeners have many different hobbies. One that I find fascinating is railroad gardening. Many railroad enthusiasts have found another way to enjoy their hobby and to share it with their friends. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we explore one family's unique hobby. Joining me today on Prairie Yard and Garden is Bob and Thea who are enthusiasts about railroad gardening. It's great to uh, be in your backyard and, and see what a railroad garden is. I have a personal interest in railroading and, and use it in a number of speeches and to me this is an ideal hobby. How did you get started? Well, um, I think Thea and I have been interested for many, many years, you know, 20, 30 years in trains and, and in uh, miniature railroads. but. Um, Initially with garden trains, uh, we were at a hobby shop and uh, Thea saw up a starter set kind of up on the wall and he said, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a garden train? And I was extremely skeptical of that idea because I couldn't get my head around how such a thing would ever happen, particularly how you walk around your yard and mow the grass with a rail, you know, train track on it. Uh -huh. So then later we went to a very big uh, train show in Seattle and uh, we saw a lot of different trains and we thought, well, we'll, we'll just start with an N-scale train. We'll have an N-scale train in our house. So in about 2002, we, we got an N-scale train going. And after we got involved with that, Thea said, let's join the Garden Train uh, Society, Minnesota Garden, train, Garden Railway Society. And so we joined that and we got to see other people's garden trains. And uh, very shortly after that, uh, we uh, bought ourselves a little starter set, brought it home. Two hours later, we had a train running. How did you initially decide what gauge you would use in a garden? I, I assume there's a number of different sizes. There are a number of different gauges. Uh, this is G-scale gauge, and Garden Railway magazines always show G-scale. Uh, seldom you'll ever see a different scale than that because you, you kind of need a larger scale to run in the garden in order to have the right perspective and the right proportions. Uh, the small scale trains just don't look right in the garden, at least I don't think they do. Uh, and uh, G scale trains are much easier to set up and much easier to maintain than like an HO or, or an O scale would be. Which are smaller versions? Much smaller, yeah. So the G scale is actually a 1 to 24 scale as compared to HO which is 1 to 87. And when you put the accessories, if you try to approach some semblance of scale throughout your garden, uh, an adult in G scale is about two inches tall. So you can't, if you're standing up, you can't see something much less than two inches tall, uh -huh. at least not with older eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have a track here that's uh, snapped together. Are there other styles? Um, because I see some unique curves and so forth. Uh, what's that process like? Well, uh, these are all, like you say, snapped together. They actually push together with brass couplers uh, that uh, just hold them in place. Uh, but uh, some of the more advanced and, and more dedicated people make their own rails and, and, and make their own ties that they put under them and literally nail them down or screw them down and they'll bend the rails just the way they want them. 
but we buy our track in pieces and then push them together and set them up the way we like. What kind of maintenance is needed on a track like this? We're outdoors, uh, a nice uh, yeah. overcast day, but potentially rain, does that affect the, the trains? The, tra the track will uh, develop a layer of corrosion after about two or three days. Uh, so what I'll do when I want to run the train, if I haven't run it for a few days, is I'll get uh, a drywall sander and I just rub that on the track and that the sandpaper will rub the corrosion off because uh, you need uh, the corrosion to be gone so there's a good electrical connection with the wheels and with the feet of the locomotive in order to, to run uh, on the uh, track. What happens with this in the wintertime? We just leave it out. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother it. We, we do bring the buildings in and every time we use the train we bring the train in. Um, but the transformers and the train, and the, uh, they go in every time we use it after we're done. But the buildings, for the most part, go in in, in the wintertime. The track just stays out here. We're not worried about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what kind of investment would you have in that little engine, a G-scale engine? That, that one over there was $270, but it's a digital sound on it, so it's a bit more expensive. The average uh, uh, G-scale engine runs between one and two hundred dollars. If you add the sound, you can add another hundred dollars. Okay. Well, that sound is a definite part of a yep. railroad garden, isn't it? It really helps. It, it, it really helps uh, enjoy watching the train. Of course, you know there are some people that buy, you know, extremely interesting large locomotives, very complicated, and they can cost one or two thousand dollars. Um, it's just how much you want to spend, that's what you can get. Probably another expensive piece of uh, railroad garden is that transformer. Yes. Uh, can we go take a look at that and, and see how that uh, fits into the system? You bet, let's go, it's right over here. Well Bob, uh, here's a transformer, what's unique about those? Well, there's two transformers here. They're fairly large, as you can see. Uh, they are designed for G-scale trains. Uh, and a lot of people like this particular transformer because it has a very reliable power and uh, it seems to work real well if you have track power. Some people have batteries in their locomotives and they don't even need anything like this. And if they have a battery operated locomotive, it saves them a lot of trouble in the conductivity of the track because you do get shorts uh, due to corrosion, moisture and the train will just stop as it's going down the track. I see our trains here, one you have two cars and one three. The outer track has a steam engine on it, and that's uh, called an American engine, and it's coming down a fairly steep grade. I couldn't actually have that train go the other way and go up the grade because it couldn't pull the cars up. It would spin out. Uh, so that's a steam train there, and an American was a very common kind of engine that we had uh, for uh, over 100 years. Now, over here we have a diesel engine. This is a Davenport diesel, and uh, Denver and Rio Grande Railroad actually had this very kind of engine running on their track. And um, it's going on a figure eight, and there's a fairly steep grade at that end. And for that reason, I can only put two cars on it. If I have more than two, it'll spin out. Do you have problems with it derailing or uh, um, shorting out very often? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a real common problem for me because the track will shift as the train keeps going through. We have chicken grit under the track as our ballast. That's the gravel they put under railroads. Uh, it's called ballast and we use chicken grit, uh, both because it's pretty reliable, doesn't wash away, and it kind of looks like railroad ballast. But that'll, it will shift and move and when that happens, the, the train will stop for no apparent reason. Another part of the railroad is the communities that are built as part of the garden. Yes. And uh, do you have a favorite to this garden? I like the far end over there. That's my wilderness section. That's, we tried to model it after the area I go camping in South Dakota. I see. Yeah. Where do you find uh, the various types of figurines and things like that? Well, uh, the people, you, you, you can go to hobby stores, they sell the people. Uh, and actually they're modeled after the same kind of people you'd buy for HO or, or even O scale. They're just bigger. They're two inches instead of small. The buildings, uh, I built the buildings here. The, they're Pico buildings. 
and they're built like a model airplane. Just use um, kind of model airplane glue and, and snap all the pieces together and glue them. Mm -hmm. Some we find uh, at garage sales, we find them in hobby stores, or we find them in gift shops. One down there we call the Alaska cabin is getting in a pretty serious disrepair. Uh, we bought in Alaska in a gift shop and uh, we let, set it out in the rain and it completely fell apart. So I had to put it all back together again and then we put spar varnish on it like what you'd have on a boat so it would be waterproof. Well, I think I'm gonna go and find Thea and have her explain some of the plant life here and some of the characters that are involved in this particular garden. Well, I gotta say that Thea designed this whole thing. I was just the gandy dancer. Uh -huh. I put the track together and got the train running, but she told me how she wanted it to be and how the track would look. And so this is all her, her idea. Well, then we need to talk to her for sure. I want to thank you. Uh, very interesting. Well, I'm glad to be here and show it to you. Well, Thea, I see a village here. How do you come up with that kind of a concept? Well, over the years, we've collected houses. First, we got our train station. You can't have a train without a train station. Uh, then we got what they sold as a bunkhouse, but became our Ole and Lena's cabin. And when people do our scavenger hunt, Ole and Lena are easy because their feet are labeled. Oh, I see that. <laughs> yes. And we found Ole and Lena in the Scandinavian store in Minneapolis. Then we have what we call our doc's cabin, and we have a doctor with a doctor's bag and his wife on the porch with him. And I like these little cabins because it allows me to use my miniature hostas, in this case Pandora's box, is just like the corner shrub. And there's a little dwarf Alberta spruce as a tree back behind, you see the outhouse. Um, so we have fun with our villages and there have been paths but they've been overgrown by our path plants, our Veronica's and Willie Times. The church Bob got for his 60th birthday and it's green but it's, it's kind of fun as a green church. Behind it is a little cameo hosta and we have a monk. Uh, my husband went to St. John so that's why we have a monk instead of a typical preacher. Uh -huh. And we have uh, a nice little mouse, holy mouse here, Hosta, in front of that. So we have our little village here. We, we have a spot for a fifth house when it comes, because I like my odd numbers. How do you determine where you're going to place these individual plants? Well, I put Generally, I put the house, and often I put a platform. I often use like a patio block or something for a platform for the house. Then the people can sit on there, and then I just landscape. You know, you want your typical landscape principles. You want different forms, textures, colors. So I have a miniature spirea by the church on the other side, the dwarf goat's beard of the darker colors with tall flowers, some pines at the back. And so I just make little miniature landscapes. And I see you have a little bridge as part of that scene. Um, do a number of gardeners include water features in their railroad garden? They do. And that, and if when you include a water feature, you really can't jump in like Bob and I do. You have to first build the water feature as part of the bones of the garden. And then you would um, add the houses and the train around that. It, ta it takes a, a lot more planning. We kind of, all of our gardens, we like to just make them so they're very flexible and movable. And um, so we, our only water feature is a little saucer with a fisherman in it. Uh -huh. But many people do really extraordinary water features. Now, as I look at this uh, particular village, has that it been redesigned several times? Does it stay the same over the years or? What happens as the plants grow and get more mature? Well, the plants grow, the houses come and go. The church used to be over where the lighthouse is. Um, and the, we get new people that we want to accent now. Another thing about my husband is he was a policeman. So at the corner of the station, we found a character with a policeman eating a donut. So we just add 
add things. Um, some places we get things when we travel, like moving along a little bit, we have this pretty turquoise glass that's common name as Arkansas glass, and we picked that up when we were driving through the Ozarks. And so it's a good place for us to display different things we have collected as we travel. Mm -hmm. I see in the distance an uh, Asian looking garden. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, one year for my birthday, my son sent me a Shinto shrine. And in that Shinto shrine, we mixed our metaphors a bit. We put our Chinese Jade Buddha. And then to the left of the shrine, there is a couple temple lights. And a couple years ago, when we were over in Japan, we picked up a couple little chubby little monk like guys. To the right, we have some pandas that we got at a zoo when we visited pandas. So again, we have things that we collect when we travel and we can just keep them in our garden. Uh, that's, that's my fun garden for concentrating my miniature hostas also. I have a um, designer gene that has the red stem. That has to be under a wire cage because my rabbits like red. They eat mm -hmm. red stemmed hostas. That's the only one they eat and they eat my red petunias. Um, then there's another number of others, uh, chartreuse wiggles at the back, torty fronds is in the smaller cage, that's a new one, a sport of the Japan hosta. Peanut is nice because it's got a nice uh, green, mostly white with a little green, and green eyes, so that's just a nice, I enjoy displaying my hostas there. I put chicken grit around them instead of mulch. For two reasons. One, when they're miniature hostas, they need something to make them stand out better. And the other thing is, my friend with the hosta business says, maybe it will uh, make the slugs uncomfortable. I have a question. I'm very interested in growing strawberries. What do I need to know to get a good crop? Okay, well this is a, a new strawberry planting that we just started about three months ago in late May. And now as we get it towards the end of summer and early fall, you can see that the initial mother plants that we put down have made lots of runners like this. And one of the things we want to do is get these runners kind of tucked down into the row. We want to form a nice narrow row about a foot to a foot and a half wide. Now the reason we want to do that is so that the, for one reason is that the strawberries don't compete with one another too much. A lot of the gardeners let their strawberry beds get very wide and what you tend to find is most of the fruit on a strawberry bed is produced right near the edges because in the middle there's just too much competition. So what we try to do is keep the rows narrow so that there's a whole lot more edge space. The other thing that that helps with is allowing the plants to dry off after we get a rain or a heavy dew and that keeps the disease problems down like the gray mold on the fruit and the leaf spotting diseases. Now the other thing we need to remember with any new planting of strawberries is that weeds are probably one of your biggest foes. And so a lot of weeding tends to be needed in that first season. We're kind of at the end of the summer weeds like this purslane here, but even right now as we get into fall, we're gonna be starting to get the winter annuals coming in. So you can't forget about your strawberries in your garden even well after they've fruited in June. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, let's move to this next section over here and see what that village looks like. Uh, this section has a couple of interesting sedums. It has my very smallest sedum as a ground cover right here in front of this little uh, kid with his hat on backwards. And that is a mini stone crop or a sedum requini, which I find very interesting. Before I did this train garden, I didn't realize the variety and scale of sedums. There's a pretty blue one over there kind of a purplish form. That's a Spanish stone crop. Uh, this one in here, I think, is my glow. As you look at those leaves, they're really pretty and they are just kind of glowing. Another thing in this section that I like is my miniature pussy toes. If you uh, are familiar with the pussy toe flower, 
The flower is about two inches long and the flower looks like the foot of a cat. Mm -hmm. So it's called Pussy Toes. That one I like. Uh, some more of our travel memorabilia is there. We have a little uh, illusionary pond with a couple of Japanese anime figures. And we call them our beach bunnies because uh -huh. we don't know their Japanese names. <laughs> I see. Well, that's appropriate. That's appropriate. Uh, behind the pond on the hillside is a miniature coral bell or hoikara. Mm -hmm. Those have not been so common. They're getting more common, I believe. There's a really small one back by the garden ladies, which we can't see from here very well. And this is the log cabin that uh, Bob was talking about that yes. you got from Alaska? That's right. Five years ago we went to Alaska. We found this log cabin and we didn't realize that it was chinked with plaster of Paris. After about two rainstorms, it started to fall apart. So now we pretty much immerse it in marine varnish every year. But it gives us a lot of nice local color. Well, and it looks like a nice weathered cabin that you would find in the woods. That's right. That's right. Very appropriate. And in the front, we, we assume that Alaskans drink Heineken. We have our Heineken beer drinker. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it looks like you got a little oompa band down here. I do. A little trio. They are uh, they're, they're serenading the Alaskans. Uh -huh. Another sedum, a seaboldi, which in this location does great. The rabbits don't eat it back there. They did. Hmm. Um, here is a nice one of the miniature evergreens that is, in fact, a miniature. This one would be the dwarf. Saguaro cypress right here. This is a very, very fun plant. Yes. They've had it about five years, so it's getting bigger, but it still isn't. It isn't and out of... That you know. one can be trimmed uh, all during the season to keep it in shape? It could be. So far, I have never trimmed it. Oh, so well, far, it yeah. just keeps a very nice natural, but as long as I stay within the new growth, I could trim it. Uh, what was this nice golden colored uh, plant? that was a dwarf golden cypress uh -huh. and so it falls with my gold colors weaving through the garden over here we have an angelina se sedum mm -hmm. and a sunshine uh, veronica which is a nice golden color well uh, it livens the garden up it does especially if it's an overcast day it really makes a difference yes one more plant that i really like is my Kenilworth ivy. This is probably a zone 5 plant. Not really hardy here. Normally I find it, I have to look in the spring under this set threaded cypress to find it, but this past winter was so snowy that it was insulated and now it's just covering a nice mat over this whole area. And it has really cute little purple flowers for, oh, for a couple months at least. So that's been a really fun plant to have. Well, it looks so unique. I don't know that I've ever seen that particular plant, but uh, man, those uh, little leaves look like they're only a quarter inch across. They do. They do. They're, it is really a fun plant. If you lived in California, you could get the standard size of this plant as a hanging basket. Well, what about this particular uh, garden? What's unique about that? This garden, as m maybe mentioned earlier, is our wilderness garden. Um, because my husband likes to go camping in the wilderness, we built a wilderness like the Black Hills in our garden. But it's also a good place to start our scavenger hunt. When people come to visit, sometimes they do a cursory look around the train and they're ready to go, and that's okay. But I always tell them they'll have more fun if they look at our scavenger hunt. And what we have on our scavenger hunt is not plants, so that people don't have to be put off if they don't know all their sedums or hostas, which I barely know myself, mm -hmm. but little characters in our garden. So one of the most first ones I like them to find is the cat lady. So right here in this little copper house, in front of the copper house, is a little lady sitting on a bench holding a cat. She's the cat lady, and just to her right is the miniature cat high hosta, one of my favorite miniatures. And as we kept going around the garden, 
There's our water feature, which is, I say that tongue in cheek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a fishing moose. Uh -huh. And the fishing moose is in fact a cork for a wine bottle. Cut off the cork and just planted the, the moose in the pond. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, on the back side, I see a, a. Oh, those are buffalo. Yes, yes. There's some buffaloes, and if you, between the tracks, you would find a little wildlife photographer photographing those buffaloes. So there are three of the items on on our scavenger hunt. There's one more right in front of us here. There is a moose and a bear having a campfire. Oh, that well, was, that's rather unique. <laughs> yes, that was kind of hard to see on the cocoa mulch, so I put sand under it to give my guests a break. Okay. Well, one other feature that uh, intrigues me is maintaining the size of the plants, especially these trees, uh, the spruces and pines and things of that nature. What process do you go through to do that, keep them in the proportion size? What I do is I work hard to stunt their growth. So every spring I take a nice afternoon, I come out here with my shovel, I dig them up, I clip off half the roots, nothing scientific, put them back in, turn them around if I think they look better a different way, and just go through them. And then at a later date I'll come through and I'll prune them when they're in their candle stage or reshape them to look more like a, a big old tree instead of a very uniformly shaped young tree. Well, Thea, I want to thank you. This has been the most interesting day, learning about a railroad and a garden. Well, thanks for coming. We always enjoy showing our garden. Maybe we can get Bob to start those engines up again and, and look at a train coming through. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding is provided by a generous gift from Irene Hansen, who shares your passion for gardening. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yackel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalomhill.org.